Hi, everybody. Did you miss me? <laughs> it's Maureen Walbyoff here, Practical Wisdom for Nonprofit Accidental Techies, doing our Friday Facebook Live thing. Uh, I was on vacation last week, which was fantastic in every way. It's always good to get a little bit of a break, no matter how much you love the folks you're working with and, and the work that you're doing. Um, so it's good to just get a little brain rinse, <laughs> come back ready to go. Um, so this week, we are going to talk about the big Salesforce news that came out a couple of weeks ago. I've spent the past couple of weeks picking the brains of people that I trust, asking Salesforce implementation partners that I know, um, some other software providers. Uh, for their take on the big Salesforce news. Um, you may not know what that big news is. So let's, uh, let's talk about this, right? We're gonna break it down. Um, a few weeks ago in April, Salesforce.com, the company, announced uh, uh, that they had purchased Salesforce.org. And some of you may be thinking, I didn't know there were two sales forces. <laughs> what? Uh, this is even more confusing to me just hearing that there were two entities. Um, there were actually three sales force entities up until a few weeks ago. Salesforce.com is the for profit company that sells Salesforce the product to for profit businesses of all different sizes and shapes and business models all over the world. So salesforce.com sells the platform to for-profit companies, um, charges them license fees, um, provides a lot of support, does a lot of research and development for the platform that's used by companies that are for-profit. Then you've got Salesforce, or you did have <laughs> Salesforce.org until a couple of weeks ago. Salesforce.org is the entity that has been providing, selling, um, and doing research on the Salesforce product that is used by nonprofit organizations like us. Um, they are the entities through which you would get your Salesforce licenses, they're the ones who maintain the community, and there have been a, historically a separate group of salespeople, account managers, who work just with people in the nonprofit space. I need some water. Oh, it's been a long Friday already. Um, so Salesforce.com sells the product to for-profit companies. Salesforce.org has sold, provided the product to nonprofit entities. And Salesforce Foundation, which is the third Salesforce entity, has historically been the place where nonprofits apply to get those free Salesforce licenses. Um, historically, Salesforce.org has given up to 10 free licenses of the Salesforce product to qualifying nonprofits. And those licenses have been granted through an application process with the Salesforce Foundation. Confused? Yes, get ready. It's going to get simpler, but maybe more complicated as we talk uh, for the rest of this little session today. So, dot com, for profit, dot org, nonprofits, foundation, philanthropic arm, where you get the, oh, you missed the news, Scott. Okay, I'm glad that you're here. You can carry this right back um, to the folks that you touch in the nonprofit space. Um, so, we've always had three. Now, Salesforce.com has purchased Salesforce.org. And that caused, in some circles, a big, like, oh no, you're going to get rid of the free license program. We're now going to have to pay a lot for it. Maybe they'll get rid of the whole nonprofit platform and focus just on for profit. So, the news when it came out, if you heard it, um, could have been a little bit alarming, um, could have made you feel like uh, I, I'm in the middle of an implementation. How is this going to change my reality? If you're using it now, you might be thinking, my budget's got to go up. My costs are definitely going to go up. Salesforce as a product 
as a CRM, a constituent relationship management system. It's a product. It has a lot of native functionality in it. And you can add more functionality by plugging in different apps. So for example, Salesforce on its own is not a donations platform. You can't use it to do online fundraising. You'd have to find an app and kind of integrate it, plug it in, have the data move back and forth and use that third party app to, to power all of your online fundraising forms. Email marketing is similar, membership, things like that. Salesforce, the CRM, is a really powerful engine that holds a lot of data. And it can serve that data up visually and in different views and for different teams. And they've got a really great mobile app. But it is kind of a, a universe that requires an, a nonprofit to navigate different vendors, uh, different implementation partners, historically salesforce.org and the Salesforce Foundation to get those free licenses. So it's a complex little ecosystem. And if you want to know a little bit more about my thoughts on Salesforce, you can hop over to my blog at meetmaureen.com and look for a post, a really popular one called Four Things Your Organization Must Know Before You Move to Salesforce, where I tease into a little bit of the way things have been. Now, we've seen, those of us who hang out in nonprofit software circles, changes come to the business all the time, right? Products get acquired, they go away, um, they are no longer supported, new products show up on the market all the time. And businesses make these decisions really frequently. Most of the time, they don't impact us, though. Um, if if they do, it's usually in a very positive way. So if a company like Blackbot acquires, um, when they acquired Attentively, for example, that's a social media um, analysis platform, they've put that into some of their products. So for nonprofit folks, it can be a, a big benefit to have an organization. Kate, good to see you here. Um, if you've got a, an organization that um, uses social media and you're using Blackbot products, Having new stuff show up is always a good thing, right? Um, so the market's always moving. It's always changing. But this particular news um, freaked out some people, freaked out some people. And so I picked the brains of people that I trust, most particularly um, a strategic tech consultant located in the Beltway. His name is Watt Hamlet. I'll put a link to his um, LinkedIn profile uh, in the comments once the video is done. He just wrote a really great article for LinkedIn that like lays out what his thoughts are based on you know, his level of intel. Um, when I first reached out to people, these implementation partners, all of them seemed to be taken by surprise. They didn't know about it. It felt very abrupt, no heads up for the nonprofit folks who work with organizations like yours on the Salesforce platform. And so, you know, they were like, I have no comment, <laughs> Maureen. I have no comment at this, at this time. we got to let it shake out. And that's a really healthy um, attitude because when businesses acquire other businesses, it takes a while for things to shake out and change. So part of my advice to you is going to be sit tight and just uh, pay attention. Um, so what we've learned is that this acquisition, salesforce.com acquiring salesforce.org, has actually been in the works inside the Salesforce business ecosystem for a couple of years. They've been figuring this out and planning this, um, all internal, really on a need-to-know basis. And so the announcement was made a few weeks ago that this was a done deal. The foundation is going to be preserved as a single unit, philanthropic arm. Whether or not that's how we still get our free licenses um, applying through the foundation, TBD, nobody really knows. Um, for now, they are saying that they're committing to keeping the free license program running. So if you're using Salesforce now and you, you're using those free licenses, 
don't worry about it. Uh, they, they say that they're going to keep this program going. One thing I've told some of my clients who are looking at Salesforce as a CRM um, is you might want to budget for licenses. You know, you might want to say eh, 50, 60 bucks a month, and I'm, I'm guessing um, 50 or $60 a month per license. You might want to budget in for that in your next annual budget cycle for your organization just to protect yourselves a little bit. You know, I'm guessing, but maybe they'll take it from 10 down to five. Maybe they'll give you 20. Again, you know, I don't want to speculate too wildly, but in terms of protecting yourself and being an informed consumer, I might stash a little money away for uh, some license payments in case they make a change to that in a way that we haven't expected. Um, you know, what will probably happen, what Salesforce says is going to happen is that salesforce.org, the folks that we all work with to help us use the platform, bring the platform in and so forth, will just become a business unit inside salesforce.com. So I'm picturing visually kind of all the folks that I know who've worked for salesforce.org will now be employed by salesforce.com. The hope is that all that expertise inside those folks and those business units who have worked inside nonprofits, who have consulted with nonprofits, who do thought leadership and training and find apps for nonprofit organizations to use with Salesforce, that all of that knowledge is going to remain preserved and kind of continue to be separated off as an area of deep expertise inside the Salesforce company. Some folks are saying, you know, maybe what's going to happen is those lines might blur a little bit. Um, there might be people who are selling to both for-profit and non-profit um, clients, um, which would mean a little dilution in the, you know, deep expertise. Nonprofits are special. <laughs> there are a lot of things, but they're all a little special. Um, and it takes a while living and working with and supporting nonprofit organizations to really understand what's going on inside those um, orgs. And I don't, I hope that that is not lost. That is, that is my hope. That's the hope of everybody. So will we still have a dedicated team? That's a big question, um, which could impact us as we interface with them. Um, when it comes to products, you know, one thing Salesforce has said about this acquisition is that it's going to allow them to invest research and development money in making the product better more equally between for-profit businesses and nonprofit organizations. And I think that's a great point. Um, I had a boss once who said, you know, nonprofit is a, is a tax filing status. It's not a business model. And, and that was a long time ago, and it's still very true. Um, I think we can often benefit as nonprofit organizations, businesses, if you will, um, mission-minded businesses. We can benefit from looking at for-profit enterprise and adopting some of their practices to make ourselves more efficient, more effective, and um, be able to generate more support. Think about marketing automation. You know, stuff tends to come to the nonprofit circle a little late, a little slower than it does um, in the for-profit business. So if you see a lot of really sophisticated marketing automation happening on the for-profit side, that is something that has definitely been adopted to a pretty large degree inside many nonprofit organizations. They are getting slick. They are doing customization and personalization welcome series, um, and, and that came directly from the for-profit world. Um, we saw that happening in emails that we got from Amazon or The Gap or, you know, wherever folks have your email address, much more sophisticated in, in how they're tracking you and the kinds of communications they're doing. So any kind of um, investment in R&D that's happening in the enterprise for-profit side, I think can only benefit us. But what uh, other folks in, in this inner circles are also conjecturing is uh, that this might mean that there are a certain core products that the nonprofit 
version of Salesforce will work with. Um, Salesforce.org uh, uh, has acquired some app companies recently. Round Cause is one that came um, into the Salesforce.org portfolio earlier this year. Um, so it may be that Salesforce Nonprofit Success Pack comes with some apps preloaded in it. Not saying that you couldn't switch it up, but that they might actually be putting together a more comprehensive offering. And those apps might not be the ones that work best for your organization. So again, it's probably a few years down the road, um, but that's what, what um, is going on in some people's heads. Um, finally, um, another, another buddy of mine said, most business decisions 90% of the time are made based on profit. So there's gotta be some profit um, uh, revenue stuff going on that was part of why Salesforce decided to make this move. And, you know, so now, you know, Salesforce.org is going to be a part of Salesforce.com, which means they can now start to report their revenue to shareholders and investors. It won't just be Salesforce.com revenue anymore. So it will add a lot of value. Um, very quickly, I imagine, when they really start reporting both for-profit and non-profit revenue um, streams coming in, I think that on the books, that's going to look very compelling to people who invest in Salesforce. I think that, you know, if I was going to give you some pointers here, a couple of pieces of advice, um, the first would really be to sit tight. Um, if you're in the middle of an implementation, if you're already using it and you're happy with it, um, sit tight. And I do two things to try to stay informed. The first is that I would set a Google alert for news about salesforce.org. And that way it'll just kind of show up and you don't have to go looking for it. Um, it'll be very interesting to see how information kind of gets rolled out from salesforce.com over the rest of the year. Um, so become informed do a little Google alert on salesforce.org news. Um, and if you are using Salesforce now, you probably have a relationship with an implementation partner or an agency or an individual who's supporting you. You know, they're the bat phone that you call when, when you get stuck or when you need something built out in the system that you can't do on your own. Um, so check in with them regularly. And I'm talking like once a month once every couple of months. Be proactive about reaching out to those folks and asking them for news and their impression on what's happening with this acquisition and is it trickling down to affect me and my organization. Um, and then finally, to loop back to what I said earlier, business changes happen in nonprofit software platforms all the time. We just don't hear about it. Or if we hear about it, it's with big fanfare. Like now we've acquired X, we've got new functionality in our product, isn't that great? It does to me mean that there is maybe a tick, a, just a tick more risk when you're thinking about moving into um, a Salesforce-based ecosystem. It's, it's not a proprietary system, it's open source, which has positives and ownership requirements associated with it. So if you're using a proprietary system like a charity engine or a Razor's Edge NXT or something like that, Salsa, right? You're paying the company to upkeep it, to update it, to make sure that the cloud hosting is secure, all that stuff. When you use a product like Salesforce, it is a little bit of choose your own adventure and you've got more responsibilities. Yes, it's, it will be kept safe, it will be kept secure, but you're really on the hook for making sure that any apps that are integrated are actually sending data back and forth the way that they should be. And um, my hope is, as I said earlier, that the deep expertise within the salesforce.org team and the people who support us in that platform will remain strong and um, kind of bundled together as opposed to 
now you're going to get support from people who may or may not be familiar with an app that you happen to be using because it's used exclusively by nonprofit organizations. Kate, you are on. I would love to hear your thoughts. We've had Salesforce conversations, you and I. Um, got any comments to add this afternoon? What's going on in your head when you think about Salesforce? I'll give you a minute if you feel like adding a comment. Scott, if you're on, I'd love to hear anything you've got to say about this Salesforce news now that I've laid it out for you. While we're waiting for comments, um, I want to let you know again, Watt Hamlet, really great guy, knows a ton about nonprofit technology, Salesforce included. So I will put his information below. Um, I'm doing a bunch of different webinars in May, um, one on the 21st with Blackboard, all about how to evaluate a new CRM. Um, so I'll put the registration information with that uh, for that event below. And also later that week on the 23rd, I'm doing uh, another um, webinar with Blackboard and my friends at Be The Match Foundation, all about do-it-yourself peer-to-peer events that goes along with the guide um, that we worked on together earlier this year. Next week, um, May 10th, Friday, May 10th, same bat time, same bat channel, 1230 Eastern. We're going to be talking about the product demo cycle. I've been on hours and hours of product demos lately, and I've come away with some tips for you um, to make sure that if you're working with software vendors, how to control what you see in those demos, how to get the kind of demo that you're looking for, how long should it take, uh, how much time should you dedicate, should you look at things you know, like product A on Monday, product B on Tuesday, product C on Wednesday, and you know, hold your nose and get all the demo meetings done out of the way? What's the best cadence for that? Um, so to wrap up today's viewing, we'll just say sit tight, salesforce.com has purchased salesforce.org. It's really early days. Nobody's sure exactly what this is going to mean. If you're using it, sit tight. Google alert and um, check in frequently with your Salesforce um, implementation partner or support partner. And if you've got any scuttlebutt or any news or speculation about the impact of this change on our industry, on the nonprofit technology industry, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. You can give me a thumbs up, a thumbs down. Okay, Kate read the article, awesome. And I didn't even tell her to. Isn't that great? She found it on her own. Um, we all just need to wait and see how things shake out. And isn't that always the way? <laughs> we need to have patience, grasshopper, and see. But um, I would say, yes, keep informed. And as I get more information from my buddies in the space, I will be bringing it to you through blog posts and um, newsletters and these fantastic Friday Facebook Live chats. So thanks so much, Scott and Kate, for showing up. And we'll see you on the 10th when we go deep into the demo cycle. You don't want to miss this because demos can be really great. They can be really terrible. And I want to make sure you get good ones. So with that, everybody have a wonderful weekend. And we will see you here on May 10th at 1230. Thanks so much. See you soon.